McGinley joins us this morning to talk to us about the qualifier draw and a bit about everything else that happened over the course of the weekend as well. So just to recap the, um, the qualifier draw, it's Clare against Mayo, Clare against Armagh, Leitrim against Monaghan and Cavan versus Tyrone. I have no idea where the Clare Mayo game will actually be played. Uh, we'll try and get um, potential venues for that f uh, in a moment. But uh, first off, Enda, good morning to you. Um, Tyrone have drawn Cavan away. It's not the worst draw, really. Um, and yet, I guess, avoiding another Ulster opponent is always preferable for Ulster teams at this stage of the season. Avoiding another Ulster opponent is, would be preferable, but avoiding another one of them Division 1 teams is, is probably even more important. So, Tyrone will be happy that, that they've avoided Kildare Mayo. Uh, obviously, they couldn't, they couldn't get Monaghan, but Cavan, Cavan were uh, shocking. Uh, against Down, how how they get out of that game, uh, to me, they, they just simply didn't deserve to, to get out of that game. And speaking to the Cavan man and, and Jonas uh, yesterday, he was saying that the mood after it was almost more like a like a defeat, where Down had uh, Kevin McKiernan and Connor Harrison both black carded in the first half. Ryan Johnson, their main forward, was sent off, and uh, Keel Mooney went off injured early in the second half. And yet, Calvin were still reliant on a horrible goalkeeping error and a drop goal to actually get 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 out in front of that game. So Calvin have issues. Then there was the brawl at the end of the Calvin match, which I'd imagine there's going to be suspensions coming from that. So yes, Calvin are an ultra team, and it'll be difficult. But that's that's a that's a good draw from through. Yeah, and how? So if if it felt like a defeat in the aftermath of the Calvin game, what was the general consensus among the Tyrone fans after the the Carlo game? Because it was kind of the perfect game for them in that there was a tough blanket defence for them to overcome. They did that and then they cleaned the pipes in the last 15-20 minutes and, and started racking up a few scores and getting a bit of confidence coursing through the team again. Yeah, look, playing Carlo, it's, it's, it's never going to be pretty. Throwing playing Carlo certainly is not going to be pretty. Uh, but for Drone, it was a job well done. It's not, a, it's not an easy place to go down there. They've, they've given plenty of top teams tough games over, over the years. They've obviously been there even this year. So uh, for Tyrone, it was a job well done. It was a, it was a decent draw. It was a win that they would have expected. No one could have achieved anything massive. More. Richard Donnelly at full forward has had more game time and, and done well again against Carlo. So then we changes that Mickey has started to, to instigate. It's sort of right through the National League and even now in the Championship. He's still changing that team to try and find the right balance. And so the more games he has, the better. And I think like for, for, for them, again, them Division One teams and them qualifiers, Looking at the four teams that's coming in hit from the provincial finals, following heavy beatings for, for most of them, uh, this was the last big, big finale. And I think now Throne have a very clear route uh, towards towards the Super 8. Yeah, the one exception we think is kind of Ross Common. That's going to be um, a team where nobody really wants to draw them, but everybody else, you're thinking, yeah, happy days. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everybody else would would be thinking the likes of Cork took a heavy beating. The conference isn't going to be good. Leash, any team that gets that beaten in Dublin, the Leinster final, have traditionally always struggle afterwards. And obviously Fermanagh, after so much hype for the Ulster final, and then a bad beating, they're, they're, they're going to just struggle to, to get on. And again, them teams coming in will be low of the league. And coming in against some of the big hitters in the game, that, that's going to be a big challenge. For Scotland is definitely the, the pick of them teams in terms of challenging, but at the same stage, any of them big teams, if they were faced with Roscommon to make the Super 8s, I, I think they would take that at the start of the year. So... Common certainly is by far the trickiest tie in that, uh, but I, I would imagine any of them, the likes of Kildare, Monaghan, Mayo, Throne, would all fancy their chances if they come through this round. I think they would fancy their chances in which come. Uh, there is a big opportunity though for any of those provincial losers because you look at that Clare versus Armagh match, uh, I presume you're looking at the winner of that as uh, the one potential route to get into the Super 8 and were it to be someone like Leash or Cork or Fermanagh then achieving the Super 8, I mean it's it's going to be celebratory scenes for whoever do draw the winner of Clare versus Armagh, no disrespect to them, but it does mean uh, a windfall, it does mean uh, a day out in Croke Park and it means a third game, it's a, an absolutely huge open door here uh, for one of these provincial losers who have been widely written off really over the right Likely so over the past forty eight hours. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 the way the game's worked out at the minute. At that top level, for me, there's eight teams, and and there's what we see in Division One time and time again is that there is eight teams. Yet two of them have to go down, and you end up losing a fairly good team, and then a relatively uh, a strong Division Two side, but a weak Division One side, the likes of Cav and the likes of Tipperary, the likes of Roscommon, and them sort of middle ranked teams. Then they 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 get a go at, at Division One, but there is sort of Dublin, Kerry, Galway, Donegal, Mayo. 
Joe Monaghan and, and I would have to give Kill Kildare that final slot. So but one of them's not going to be in the Super 8, which means there's going to be a, a that sort of middle tier team is going to make it, which is going to be brilliant for them, brilliant for the county. It'll be great scenes and you would just hope that, that, that it can be competitive. But you would imagine it'll be interesting. See, this is new territory for all of us. Does getting into the Super 8 for that middle rank team, does that bring them on or does that damage them more? Uh, and, and only time will tell. I, yeah, I can't tell if teams are actually getting better as the season goes on just from playing more football. Like, So you look at say Tipperary and they chronically underperformed against Cork and now we know Cork are no great shakes and yet they played pretty well for 50, 53, 54, 55 minutes against Mayo um, and then Mayo started to play really well so like it, these games it's very hard to draw a straight form line through any of them and and, and it's, it's a whole it's a big discussion point chair for, for the whole game I think increasingly the whole the whole top tier talk or they're splitting the game into two tiers or does the likes of Fermanagh's win over Monaghan or, or Leash's or Carroll's win this year does, it, does that merit sticking with a game that is so obviously imbalanced like is, is Dublin getting any benefit or supporters or followers of the game getting any benefit from watching the way Kerry and Dublin have walked through their provinces um, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced the weaker counties would point to the likes of Fermanagh the likes of Lee, the likes of Carlo this year, and say like, just look at what is, is done for their counties and their supporters, and, and absolutely, there's truth in that. But is there a progression? I think the Super Eights gives us a great uh, chance to see does a team that gets to mix it with the so-called big boys for for a period of time does that bring them on, or does it actually break them? Because if you get landed, say, with Dublin and Galway, and and they go to town on you, and say somebody like Mayo or Throne or somebody like that, it's going to be a fairly unforgiving place out there. So. Uh, that's listen. It's it's all new ground, and I can't wait to see it. But for me, looking at the football championship so far, and, con- and contrasting it with with the hurling championship, uh, you you just wish we were getting more of the big games, the big teams playing each other more often. Yeah, in in meaningful games, is absolutely, and it looks like it's actually a pretty easy fix to to get to that point. You just have to um, win over some uh, rather recalcitrant minds at the moment. I want to talk to you about Donegal because obviously this was a, another opportunity for us to see them again up against a team who were going to put that bank of defence in front of the goals. And like once you saw Donegal score an early goal, all of a sudden Fermanagh's game plan had to change, and and like. They were never going to be able to come back because they were never set up to do that. So uh, that was a, a killer instinct from Donegal, which maybe they won't get credit for because the game ends up being so one-sided and so easy for them. Yeah, absolutely. Like Donegal, I think anybody that knows the football looks at that Donegal team and just looks at the individual players and the way they play the game and realizes there's serious quality there. So you can't take that away from them. I keep going back to. We, we were starting to really believe that last year about them, that a decent uh, league campaign, a couple of big wins early on in, in the championship, and then they ran into throne and they got wiped off the pitch. Then the, their next game, the qualifiers, was against Galway, wiped off the pitch again. So the last time they came up against two big teams, they got wiped off the pitch, and then suddenly everybody at that stage was saying, ha, you know, them young fellas aren't actually up to that after all. But I was looking at their forward line yesterday in, in Kunis, you're talking about 20 year olds, 21 year olds, 22 year olds, 23. Like, there's only three or else four of the team over the age of 24. They're an exceptionally young squad and they are talented footballers. Uh, but the big tests were sort of waiting then for that team to produce a big game against a big test. It didn't arise yesterday from Kamana's. You, you, you hit the nail on the head. Kamana were dependent on keeping that game tight. They were never going to rack up a big score because they just don't have that type of game plan, they're only ever going to get to maybe 11, 12, 13 points. Uh, so as soon as Donegal were hitting one and two goals, the, the, the game was a worker for Mana. Donegal still set up quite defensively yesterday, in fairness, <laughs> those times in the game, for Mana had their full 15 back in their own half. Donegal, they were keeping one man up, Paddy McCreary. Now, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of his uh, knee injury, whether that's serious, that could have a major say on, on, on their, their likelihood to make a big impact. But Donegal, cruised through yesterday. The same questions that were there at the start of the year are still there. The same facts are still there too. They have a serious quality side, a very exciting side, particularly up front. Uh, so we'll, we'll wait to see. But Paddy McBrady's fitness and then the big game test is, is what we're waiting to see for, for Donegal. 
Uh, I trust when you said that Donegal is set up defensively, that's kind of positionally that obviously they've, they've racked up 876 in the championship, 13 different scores yesterday. Like, what, what is the difference about this Donegal team from, say, the Jim McGuinness team? Because they're obviously scoring more regularly, it seems, under the team. There's more, a wider spread of scores, while, as you pointed out, setting up in a defensive uh, position. Like, what, what, what is the big tweak there? What is Declan Bonner doing with this team that's allowing them to be so free scoring? They, they, they do pull, pull loads back. Like there, there was frequently, particularly in the first 20 minutes yesterday, frequently they, they had uh, 14 players back behind the ball. More often though, they are getting the higher quality forwards than probably Jim McGuinness had in, in his time. Out and out forwards, the, the likes of uh, the likes of Keane Mulligan, the likes of Paddy McGrady, the likes of Kieran Thompson, Langan, obviously Michael Murphy went in, Ryan McHugh is in, in the form of his life at the minute. He, he's just unstoppable. So they have serious uh, attacking threat. How much different it is from the Jim McGuinness area? From before I seen them yesterday, and I have seen them a couple of times this year. They didn't seem to be keeping more up the pitch. Now whether they just done that to negate, because as many teams have learned, and as Dublin show again, whenever they, whenever a team comes up a blanket defence, you almost have to mirror them in a certain way. So I'm not sure that was the way Donegal would have wanted to play. I think they would want to keep maybe more, at least two or three players up. But I think any team, when you come up against that flank of defence, I think you end up having to mirror them a wee bit until you get them crucial early lead, and then you can sort of go go, go back to your normal system. So uh, I don't think yesterday was definitely how, how Donegal would set up. But for me, the, the difference with the Jim, well, there's, there's nothing really wrong with the Donegal and the Jim McGuinness era, but the difference maybe in the Rory Gallagher era, uh, he, Declan Bonner has much more forward potential than maybe Rory Gallagher was dealing with in, in his couple of years. Do, do you think then the, the result yesterday and the manner and the ease of victory that uh, Donegal notched up yesterday could be the start of a precipitative decline in the full-out uh, blanket defence and kind of full-blown defensive tactics in Ulster football and elsewhere as well that Donegal are showing that you can be solid at the back while scoring freely? Yeah, look, that's, I've, I've heard that said a number of times. I would love it to be true. Uh, I think anybody that, that loves the game would prefer uh, a more sort of natural, traditional approach to an extent. I think tactics are, are a good thing. It, it makes the game more interesting. The problem with the blanket defence is it is so damn effective. Uh, for man overturn, like, look at the teams that have been competitive this year, that if they went in a shootout, they wouldn't be. And teams, the people are saying, look, surely these teams are going to learn the lesson that the blanket defence doesn't win the matches. They've won them more matches than they would have otherwise. There has been more hammering handed out in Gaelic in this last three or four years than probably in the last 20 years combined because of the strength of the top teams. So if a team is wanting to be competitive in that, they have to be defensive. Otherwise, they're into a shootout. And they don't have the quality to win in a shootout either. So if, say, Fermanagh went to go to to toe with Donegal, with Dublin, with Tyrone, an all-out shootout, people would call them naive, and rightly so, because they'd get wiped off the pitch. So... They, they have to be defensive. They they got them two goals, and if they could have prevented them, that game would have been tighter for much longer, as was the Monaghan game, and they managed to get a result. So I think it's a bit flippant for, for people to be saying, look, surely these teams will learn the defensive system isn't going to win. Well, the shootout system wouldn't win for them teams either, in my opinion. So uh, the defensive system has worked on a number of occasions for teams to overturn or remain competitive against other teams. So for as long as it does that, uh, I think it'll remain a feature of the game. Yeah, but it's just, it's just a, using your available resources in a tactically astute manner. It's not like I'm wedded to this philosophy of playing crap football for the sake of playing crap football, which seems to be the kind of great philosophical debate of our time. No, absolutely. Like It's like every... like Looking at the world of football, looking at soccer, it's like every team wanting to go out and play like Barcelona. You can't do that. You know, It's, it's just not going to work for, for all teams. So for... For Gaelic and for the traditionalists to be calling for that, it's it's rubbish in my opinion. Uh, I think uh, getting a balance right would be important. I think maybe some rule changes to try and stop. Whenever two teams do set up all out defensively, it is tough to watch. And because it's so effective, I don't. I always believed in the natural evolution of the game. I'm beginning to doubt that belief because I think that the all out defensive tactics are so effective that there's no real reason for for the game to evolve uh, at the minute anyway. Uh, apart from the top teams, but it will continue to get some pretty poor games, and I don't think that great for the game overall. I, I mean, like my only counter argument to that is that if we were to 
experiment at least for a while with a tiered championship where there was the prospect of promotion and relegation. You can't just be a defensive team because you're trying to get out of your division and at that point you're forced to evolve and at that point then there's a clash of styles becomes interesting as opposed to, well, we're just going to sit back and be a mid-tier team who's happy to maybe win two games in the provincial championships, one qualifier, and then we can all go home and play club football, which is really what we want to do anyway. Yeah, look, you're, you're preaching to the converted there. I think a tier championship would allow them, all our teams, to really come out and play football. I think it has to be created in a way and given enough coverage in a way to, to make it really viable for them players uh, to be a real part of it. Uh, that's for a lot of deep thinking for the GA, and even when it comes to media rights, for me, the, the lower tier championship has to be given uh, at least, say, a third of the media rights coverage to really give 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 that competition a profile, which maybe it hasn't seen in hurling, because the hurling championship, whilst it's brilliant at the top level, we have completely forgot about every other hurling team in the country that isn't in that top championship, and that's 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 not ideal either. So the hurling top tier is brilliant, great to watch, but there is a huge problem with 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 elitism and, and hurling, which their tiered competitions hasn't helped either. So football maybe can take some of the lessons from that. Uh, and that the tiered competition does create great teams both at the top and at the middle tier. Uh, but also the, the middle tier has to get much more coverage and much more uh, highlights because the games at that level and the players at that level will be putting in as much uh, will be putting in as much effort. And the entertainment fair whenever two evenly matched teams go together, it doesn't matter what creative football you're playing, the entertainment whenever two evenly matched teams go together in championship, whenever there's something important on the line, will be brilliant. If teams get on a run, the supporters will get in behind them. So I'd be absolutely of, of that opinion that, that that can help a number of builds in the game. But uh, unfortunately, at the minute, the weaker counties just aren't uh, aren't interested really at all. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense for them to try and um, uh, build that style of play because ultimately they end up getting hammered by the good teams. Um, a quick word about Kerry before we let you go here because they were obviously sensational on Saturday night. And they look to have a forward line that is as exciting and as vibrant and creative and, and can do anything in any style um, against any opponent. Obviously, we still haven't really seen them against a, a proper team just yet. So it's hard for us to pitch where exactly they are versus Dublin, who are the standard bearers. So what's your take on where Kerry are at the moment? Uh, mighty impressed. Uh, like, like you can go back to just similar to Donegal, you're sort of watching football as, as a football and you can see just players doing stuff of real quality that... You can't fake. There's, there's no faking it. And for Kerry, that forward line, wow, we like it is just it's it's probably better than than Dublin's forward line, uh, and that's that's saying something. You know, just the, the, the talent and and the the, the variation they have. Gainey, Donahue, uh, Clifford, obviously three three very different players in O'Shea and Stephen O'Brien. They have so much talent and and variation in their play that they are going to give lots of headaches. The, their their issue is of course uh, defence. Cork got in for two relatively cheap goals, uh, and Cork aren't going to be where where the likes of Galway or, or Dublin are. Uh, so the defensive test will be there. It was great to see as a throw man. I was delighted to see their forwards at times. I've seen numerous times their forwards surrounded Cork players and the physicality of their tackling. It reminded me of the good old two football scenes. It was, it, it was something else to see. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, Kerry, really, really impressive. Very exciting. I think everybody at the minute is clinging on to hope that there's some team to really bring it to bring it to Dublin. Uh, even as a drone man, I'm excited that Kerry died. But I think there's there's a number of other teams. Donegal's looking good. Always looking good. Throne, I think, are still developing and, and, and maybe can pose a, a, pose a bigger challenge. So there's, there's stuff there. And hopefully the football championship's going to catch light as, as we head towards the Super 8. Looks like we're on the verge of it. And great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Yeah. Uh, always great stuff from Andy McGinley giving us his thoughts there.